This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. And a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. All right. Rolling, rolling. Okay, let's go. Over the past five months, just about everyone I know has come to the same conclusion. Dyed-in-the-wool liberals are as much the enemy of normal, decent people as conservatives are. And when I say liberal, I don't mean your average Joe who likes Harry Potter and Marvel movies and doesn't really think about politics outside of election years. Will you who shut up, man? Person? I mean the people who love Harry Potter and Marvel movies and also go out of their way to scold Palestinians for resisting their own extermination. People who demand you condemn Hamas while refusing to acknowledge that history didn't begin on October 7th. People who split their time evenly between rewatching Hamilton and calling anyone who criticizes Joe Biden a Russian troll or a Chinese spy. I think you know the type. But just so we're on the same page before we go any further, let me be extra clear. Liberalism is the default ideology in the imperial core. The average person ends up with a liberal perspective by osmosis. There is a pipeline from simply existing in the empire to becoming a rabid servant of the empire. And if you feel like this is an attack on you personally, please don't feel that way. Everyone should be capable of changing their perspective when presented with new evidence. If you're not, that's a good sign you may have been indoctrinated into a dangerous ideology. But that's what this video is about. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of evidence that Western liberals are a tremendous force for evil. And contrary to what they want you to believe, they absolutely do not care about truth, justice, peace, or progress. Let's start with the civil rights era. A lot of Americans today erroneously believe that when Dr. King came onto the scene, he magically opened everyone's eyes and ended racism. Sure, things were bad back then, but his words were so moving that everyone put down their pitchforks and agreed that we were all equal. And of course, the white liberals were marching hand in hand with black Americans to forge a path to a brighter future. While MLK did have a profound way with words, and there were indeed a number of white Americans who marched for equal rights, this simplified view of the civil rights era is exceptionally misleading. Martin Luther King is one of the most co-opted figures in modern history. Everyone tries to claim him for their particular set of beliefs. I made a whole video about how history whitewashes black radicals. But the thing about these people waxing poetic about how great King was is that 90% of the time, they would have hated the man had they lived in the same era. Think about your family members today and how they reacted to the Black Lives Matter rallies and protests. If they're anything like my family, you probably heard some pretty ignorant, hateful statements. The same exact thing happened in Dr. King's time. Police brutality, rampant racism, and constant attempts to misconstrue what the movement was really about. The thing that always concretizes that fact for me is this comic, by the white moderate cartoonist Charles Brooks. King talking to a reporter with the city destroyed in the background and some white people lying on the ground, and King saying, I plan to lead another non-violent march tomorrow. This is exactly what we see today. Liberals get uncomfortable and suddenly they're not for equal rights anymore. Or more accurately, they still say they are, but they just have some concerns about optics. That's not how you're supposed to protest. Why can't everyone just protest peacefully? Why? So you can ignore it? The entire point of protest is to be disruptive. But even if we put that aside, no one wants to have to protest. 
They want things to change with as little friction as possible. But that's just not how things work when the oppressor class likes their position and that position is dependent upon subjugating another class. It's like Castro said during the Cuban Revolution. The people did not choose the path of armed struggle. It was the path that was forced upon them. Same with Palestine. The number of tweets I've seen from liberals saying, I don't understand why they can't just peacefully protest, is insane. And every single time, someone claps back with a different instance of Palestinians peacefully organizing and being killed all the same. By the time King penned his letter from Birmingham jail, which you heard some of at the beginning of this video, he had become disenchanted with white northern liberals, who had earlier in his career been his greatest source of white support. But when King started talking about systemic issues that intersected with racism, such as economic inequality, these liberals started to squirm. The comfortable whites who looked down on the southern yokels for their ignorance and racism were now in the hot seat themselves. They benefited from a two-tiered society in which liberal elites were at the top. And so the complaint about optics was born. Look, Dr. King, we support your ideals, but the way you're protesting just isn't okay. This is the way liberals operate. They support emancipation movements in theory, but as soon as it crosses into the realm of the material, they become no different than conservatives. If violent protest is illegal, and nonviolent protest gets your liberal supposed supporters to condemn your movement, what recourse do you have to effect change? There's a reason imperial core countries are actively trying to criminalize various forms of protest. They have a vested interest in things remaining the same. As Kwame Ture said in his 1969 book The Pitfalls of Liberalism, what a liberal really wants is to bring about change which will not in any way endanger his position. That is, of course, impossible when we're talking about fixing the systemic problems of racism, imperialism, and economic inequality. According to a 1966 Harris poll, King's favorable rating among white Americans was just 27%. Compare that to 95% today. That's how liberals operate. They oppose any attempts at emancipation while they're happening, then pretend they were always on the side of the righteous when they have the benefit of history books telling them who the good guys were. There's a great tweet that really sums up this liberal tendency. A liberal is someone who opposes every war except the current war, and supports all civil rights movements except the one going on right now. Now, while MLK was outspoken in his disappointment with white liberals, Malcolm X went a critical step further and correctly labeled them an enemy of genuine progress and liberation. The conservatives are wolves. You know what they're up to. They're evil and they're honest. Not because they care about being honest, but because they're not afraid to wield power when they have it. The liberal is a fox. Less outwardly threatening, even seemingly approachable, but still a predator. A conservative will usually be open about their racism and how they need to keep the dirty foreigners out. Whereas a liberal will say things like, I see you. I hear you. Hate has no place here. And then they'll run campaign ads about how conservatives are failing to secure the southern border. Biden hasn't stopped building Trump's wall. That should tell you everything you need to know about the liberal approach to immigration. Pretend you're deeply concerned, and then do the same thing the conservatives are doing. Or take the genocide in Gaza. We've seen a handful of the more liberal Democrats speak out against what Israel is doing, which is no small feat for a politician in the United States. But then when push comes to shove, they do the evil thing anyway. As I'm writing this script, every single Senate Democrat just voted to continue funding the genocide in Gaza. Every single one. It's like the meme. The people on the receiving end of US militarism don't care whether the people who sent the bombs are deeply concerned about it. They're still sending the bombs. Socialists like me tend to joke about Democrats just being Republicans with a rainbow flag painted on their bombers, but it's absolutely true. The liberals' only objection to imperialism and global domination is on aesthetic grounds. They may say they're cool with gay people, but they're still gonna turn the rest of the world to glass if it means maintaining our hegemony. A good example of this meaningless liberal pandering is when Pharrell recently sent Trump a cease and desist to stop Trump from using his songs at rallies. And then he turned around and performed at a fundraising gala for the IDF. The people who've killed 11,000 children in the past few months, who have targeted doctors saving injured people, journalists trying to show the world what's happening, the people who blindfolded a man, told him to run, and then sniped him in the back of the head. Okay, celebrities being useless is one thing, but when you have a liberal world leader, that's when things get really dangerous. Take Trudeau, for example. In response to one of the many ongoing protests for Palestine in Canada, on February 13th, he posted the following on Twitter. 
The demonstration at Mount Sinai Hospital yesterday was reprehensible. Hospitals are places for treatment and care, not protest and intimidation. I strongly condemn this display of anti-Semitism. In Toronto and across Canada, we stand with Jewish communities against this hate. This is insane. If you've been online at all in the last five months, you'll know where I'm going with this. Justin Trudeau, liberal darling, has supported to the hilt the Israeli apartheid regime, which has bombed every single hospital in Gaza out of operation. Not only that, these monsters also dressed as doctors and nurses and infiltrated a hospital to shoot and terrorize the patients and heroic staff inside. To the liberal, walking outside a hospital and demanding justice is a bridge too far. But butchering an entire population because it serves the interest of capital is perfectly acceptable. The justification for statements like Trudeau's has always been opposing anti-Semitism. That obviously doesn't work anymore. It's an absurd claim to make that criticizing a genocidal apartheid regime is anti-Semitic. And it's become even more clearly absurd now that we've seen hundreds of thousands of Jewish people around the world stand up against Israel's ethnic cleansing campaign and say, you do not represent us. All you have to do is look at footage from within Israel itself. Jews are brutalized by the fascist police for daring to speak out against the regime. The anti-Semitism charge obviously doesn't work anymore. So the liberals have fallen back on what they do best, weaponizing vague feelings. The main objection to rallies for Palestine now is that it makes people feel uncomfortable or unsafe on college campuses in the West. Here's an example that's been making the rounds online. They want him dead. Please end it. Aside from the fact that those are the most obvious fake tears you've ever seen, I want you to think about the absurdity of this display. Claiming to feel unsafe in your insular little university versus this. That's what unsafe looks like. You feel uncomfortable? Think about how uncomfortable it is to have no food or clean water, no shelter, no hygiene products, your family killed, the places you've been told will be safe purposefully targeted with bombing runs. Liberals have no right to cry crocodile tears and pretend to feel unsafe. Of course, they'll still do it, and sometimes it will work. There are very few weapons as dangerous as a white woman's tears, as minorities have learned the hard way throughout history. Enough pretend fear and they get what they want. In this case, the criminalizing of solidarity with the people currently being exterminated. I made a tweet the other day that said, one thing that's been bothering me recently is that I have no power to make liberals care. I can say, I will never again speak to someone who still supports Israel, but what good is that? The hate and powerlessness I feel is something I haven't experienced before. I had one commenter respond with something I think is important to share. This is how colonized people have felt forever. Liberals act like they care, but they don't. They really, really don't. And their fake performative caring actually makes it way worse. At least right-wingers are honest. That's a great point. And it echoes what Malcolm X said half a century ago. Liberals are no better than conservatives. They're often even more bloodthirsty as we've seen with their recent behavior. The only thing that separates a liberal servant of empire from a conservative one is that the liberal will lie through their teeth to make it seem like they're on your side. At least when a conservative says they want you dead, you can believe it and brace for impact. With a liberal, you have to be a lot more vigilant. Conservatives don't care if they have the moral high ground. They want what they want, and they don't care how you feel about it. A liberal will twist themselves into knots trying to convince you, and often themselves, that they are the moral arbiter of modern politics. Even the liberals who are critical of Joe Biden and the wider West's enabling of this genocide often speak out in a way that ends up reinforcing belief in liberalism. Take the recent drama surrounding Jon Stewart. He said some common sense stuff about Biden and really pissed off the vote blue no matter who crowd. But his criticisms also really resonated with the masses of more casual liberals in the imperial core. His statements were intended to air the concerns of people starting to feel cognitive dissonance about their support of genocide, and then to steer them back into the fold of the Democratic Party. Yeah, Biden may be too old for the job, but we'll do better next time. The most important thing is keeping Trump out of the White House. Things would be so much worse under a Republican, believe me. 
Never mind, of course, that things are only this bad because Biden, liberal champion of peace and freedom, has personally refused to call off his attack dog, and has instead spent billions of dollars of your tax money to fund the massacre of tens of thousands of men, women, and children whose only crime is trying to prevent the slow-rolling eradication of their people and their history. I could go on like this, or hell, I could just leave the video running and play the hundreds of hours of footage showing what Western liberals are enabling in Gaza. Children torn to pieces hanging from piles of rubble. A man so stricken with grief that he loses consciousness after being told his entire family has been killed. A beautiful little girl my daughter's age standing alone in the cold, waiting for parents who will never come back. But I know that footage will not soften the liberal heart. If they've made it this far and not changed their mind, they are irredeemable, and I will not waste any more of my time trying to win over my enemy. And for those who think I'm being overly harsh and that liberals are annoying but not really all that dangerous, I'll cite just one more historical fact. Every time liberals have been given the choice between socialism and fascism, they have sided with fascism. And when I say they've sided with fascism, that's actually a little misleading. Yes, normal liberals, the individuals, will always pick a well-dressed white fascist over a scary urban communist. But liberals as a political organism don't really choose to side with fascism as much as they devolve into it. Fascism is rooted in the same Western mythology as liberalism. Whereas in times of peace and prosperity, liberalism has all the frills and niceties normal people would expect from a first world country, as soon as the economic base falters, as soon as the lines start to go down, the mask comes off. It's often said that fascism is capitalism in decay. And if there's one thing we've seen with the United States since the Reagan years, it's that capitalism is on the decline. There's a reason we're always at war. Why our civil liberties are being curtailed under conservative and liberal leaders alike. Why Joe Biden is holding twice as many immigrants in cages as Trump was at the end of his term. Why we're backing Israel to the very last Palestinian. When capital has to circle the wagons to maintain its dominance, its rhetoric and actions start to look a lot like fascism. The reason for this is simple. Fascism is seen as a solution to an economic problem, just as socialism is. But the difference is that fascism does not threaten the primacy of capital, or the comfortable position of the white liberal. Economic hardship creates conditions where bitterness, distrust, and desperation can thrive, making the masses an easy target for charismatic and bombastic fascists. I'll end with a gentle warning for new socialists. People who understand that imperialism is wrong but who may still harbor some liberal ideology from their upbringing. There's this pervasive belief that if you just show people enough data that something is bad, we'll reach a critical mass of collective outrage and then suddenly, through legal and government-approved means, we'll be able to stop the bad thing. That's just not how the real world works. That's become abundantly clear in the last five months. Bit by bit, our rights to protest, to assemble, to speak out, are being taken away. The Palestinian people have tried peaceful protest for years. They've tried appealing to international bodies. They've tried everything. They are well within their rights to resist their executioners by whatever means they deem appropriate. No amount of liberal hand-wringing and phony moral objections will change that fact. You don't get freedom peacefully. Freedom is never uh, safeguarded peacefully. Anyone who is depriving you of freedom isn't deserving of, an, of a peaceful approach uh, by the ones who are being deprived of their freedom. A few times in the last couple years, I found myself thinking, surely not these liberals. Surely this friend or this educated person or this family member will be different. And they disappoint every single time. At some point, all decent people have to realize that liberals are as much the enemy as conservatives. They may weaponize inclusive language, they may try to trick you into thinking they care, but it's a lie. The Western liberal position on Palestine should be the final nail in the coffin of liberal legitimacy. And I know it's not my job to call people out like this. I know my role is to be inclusive and offer a charitable on-ramp into socialist ideas. But sometimes you just have to tell it like it is. Malcolm X was right. Liberals are the most dangerous thing in the Western Hemisphere. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that my content is only possible thanks to my patrons on Patreon. 
For people who make principled socialist content, and especially content that's vocal in its support of Palestine, it's really hard to land sponsorships. In fact, I was in talks with a sponsor recently, everything was going fine, and then the rep hits me with this email. Sorry, your content has been flagged for brand safety. I politely ask for clarification, and they just ghost me. Stuff like this is why I have to rely so heavily on Patreon. I'm not willing to compromise my principles to make more money. If I wanted to do that, I'd just make a Why I Left the Left video and land a million dollar gig with the Daily Wire tomorrow. That's not why I make my videos. But my content is difficult to produce, and I need to support myself and my team. If you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate your support. Every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, and I try to do a live Q&A every month or so. We've built a great community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. We're a small team here. We don't have institutional backing, so we're entirely dependent on viewer support. If you'd like to help keep this operation afloat, visit patreon.com slash secondthought and become a patron today.